Perfect. Thanks, Simon. I'm Keith McLaughlin from Integral Asset Management. And the, the point of this series is really an introduction to fundamental investing. Uh, this is part one in fundamentals. Let me first of all unpack the objective of the series and where this first one slots in. So what we're setting out to do is to understand a business, then consider its listed shares as a potential investment, and ultimately consider a basket of these to construct a portfolio. Um, the first part, understanding a business, is what we're going to be talking about this evening. And that's number one. It's uh, fundamentals. Is What we are asking the question is really, really simple question to ask, really, really complicated question to answer is, is a company good or bad? Um, from there, we'll naturally go to valuation next, uh, next time then portfolio construction, and the final one, we'll wrap it all up with a case study and, and hopefully plenty of time for Q&A. What we are not focusing on in this, in this series is mathematics, mathematics formulas, financial jargon, uh, ratios. All of those are very important concepts, but given by virtue of you attending this presentation online, you guys have the internet. And by having the internet, you have the collective knowledge of humankind at your fingertips. And you can Google and research these things extensively. There is lots of resources out there and lots of ways to chop, slice, compare, and unpack these things. Um, they, but they are technical. And if you don't understand the core first principles of fundamentals, they, you won't know what you're looking for. So our objective is to arm you with that background knowledge. And I do reference things you can look at, but, but you can go and research it on your own time. So the objective here is really truly is an introduction to fundamentals and us looking at in this webinar on understanding a business. Is a business good or bad? So in terms of agenda, what we're going to run through tonight is utility, scarcity, and problem solving. Um, these, are, these are foundational economic concepts. They, they even before currency and before all those other things, right at the core of economics is the principle of scarcity and that's interaction that ultimately generates utility. Um, um, and really how that drives businesses. If you, if you can understand this part, um, you, you, you're a good way of the way in understanding how businesses, how good businesses generate returns. Um, then we look at a, a kind of high level. So we're starting high and we're zooming in. Uh, we're looking at in the industry and sector level barriers to entry, looking a little bit more specifically in businesses, competitive advantages. We're touching on substitutes and pricing power, the markets that these businesses operate in. These are all high level macro business model and almost philosophical uh, aspects to consider in understanding a business. But even the best business in the best market can be badly run. Uh, so then we zoom into an individual business and we're looking at very key things for that on a granular detail, that business. Does it generate cash? How is the debt and gearing and risk cost structures and various other, other considerations? before wrapping it all up. And hopefully we have plenty of time for questions and hopefully you guys have plenty of questions. Um, so jumping into the initial concept of utility, scarcity and solving problems. First, let's unpack what utility is. Utility is an economic principle representing value. Now value exists because demand for something interacts with the scarcity of that thing. Um, we live in a finite world. There are scarce resources um, and the demand for them even fluctuates. But standing back, utility can perhaps be best described in terms of a glass of water. So we all need to drink water uh, to stay hydrated or else we die of dehydration. Fundamentally. That, that simple. There's no way around this. As, as living human beings, we need water, and most of nature does as well. Therefore, water has utility. It has value. And notice I haven't put a currency value on that. It, 
in the absence of currency for as long as life's existed on earth, it's needed water. Um, and only recently have we started attaching currency values to it. So utility predates all of this. It's the start of it. But the value of that glass of water can change. If, if I give you a glass of water standing in your kitchen with water in your tap, well, that glass of water I give you, you still need, need water to survive, but it's probably not worth very much to you. As opposed, if you're in the middle of the desert, dying of thirst, and I give you a glass of water, that water has immense utility. It can literally be life-saving. And you can see how the moment in the background, a glass of water has value, but the interaction between the demand for that water and the scarcity of the resource creates something we call value. Now, what is currency? Currency is, and, or money is just how we track value. That's it. Instead of bartering items, we give a price to them and we exchange with, uh, we exchange with cash effectively, uh, which allows it to become a store of value, which is a whole nother, nother concept. Now, what is accounting then? What are the accounting records of a company? Well, an accounting records of a company are merely tracking this currency, currency in, cash in, and cash out. That is tracking utility and value generation over time. That's all it is. The accounting records of, of a company, its financial results, if you go right to the core, shows the utility it's generated and the cost that it used to generate that utility. And utility doesn't exist in the vacuum. Therefore, if the product or service of a business is useless and no one wants it, it has no utility and that business is not going to be a very good business. Uh, well, it's not going to be a business. Likewise, the opposite can be true. Uh, deeply important, highly scarce and absolutely critical um, product or service uh, can have immense utility and the economics can be very much in your favor. The only difference is how much does it generate to, how much does it cost to generate that utility? And hence we get the interaction between revenue and profit. Revenue is what people pay for the collective utility that a business has generated. It's volume multiplied by sales uh, or price, volume multiplied by price, and ultimately that reads, makes revenue. But the, the difference between revenue and profit lies in the middle, is in how much did it cost the business to generate that revenue? i.e. profit is the difference between utility and how much it costs to generate it. Profitable companies use few or fewer inputs to efficiently generate maximum utility. Another way of looking at this is utility exists because of scarcity that creates a problem. All businesses solve problems and by solving relevant problems, they generate utility. If you can find the problem and solve it repeatedly, you've got a business. Likewise, all existing successful and sustainable businesses solve problems because someone wants or needs something. Um, this is such an important concept and think deeply of all the businesses you look at, what are they actually selling? and who is actually consuming it and why. Utility and scarcity, and in the background, all sustainable businesses solve problems. So with, and I will be the first to admit, the first slide is a bit philosophical, and we're going to really econ 101 for you who have done it. For you who haven't done it, we'll just Google it. Uh, like I said, you've got collective knowledge of humankind at your fingertips, but, Stepping back, and I'm going to use a running metaphor uh, for playing a game. Let's say you're playing poker at a table um, to describe barriers to entry and uh, competitive advantages. Now, barriers to entry are, is a concept of how easy is it for a new business, a startup, to enter an existing industry. The harder it is, the higher the barriers to entry. It's almost like walls around the industry. And the lower it is, the easier it is to enter. 
um, perhaps a way of thinking about it is if you are playing a game of poker, well, if people at a table are playing a game of poker and you want to join it, how easy is it to get a seat and sit down at the table? The harder it is, and the less people playing at that game of, of poker, well, uh, the less competition there is. Same in industries. The higher the barriers to entry, the less the competition. Um, the lower the barriers to entry, the more the competition. Because especially with low barriers to entry, if an industry is doing really, really well, even though they might be long established players, well, anyone can, can join it. So you'll get a lot of new businesses flooding in and everyone is competing and becomes a complete dog show. Um, so why is it important? Higher barriers, less co competitors and less competitors. Well, it means more profits. Um, there are really three types of barriers to entry. There are legal barriers to entry. Um, these are, th these are important things that are either issued or owned that prevent because of our legal system and regulation and legislation, they stop competitors uh, entering the industry or getting a seat at, at the table. Uh, good examples is Netcare's got hospitals. You need hospital licenses to have hospitals. Without a hospital license, you're not going to have a hospital. Therefore, that is a legal barrier to entry. Uh, Sogol Gaming has casinos. Each casino needs a license, a casino license. If you don't have one, you don't have a casino. Likewise, and vice versa. Uh, people don't think about mines as having legal barriers to entry, but they do. Um, it's called mineral rights. If you own the mineral rights to something in the ground and someone else goes and mines your mineral rights, they've technically stolen from you. So it is a legal barrier to entry. Um, you will know, notice that people can compete against those without those licenses, but technically those are criminal organizations. So we're talking strictly in the, in, in, in the eyes of the law here. Um, then we shift to knowledge or intellectual property, RP barriers to entry. These are literally, you know how to do something that someone else doesn't know how to do. Uh, think of Microsoft. They've got all the code for Microsoft Windows. Um, think of Pfizer. They've got all, all, all the formulations and patents for their, for their range of ethical pharmaceuticals and vaccines and even even indirectly through a partnership, the mRNA COVID vaccine. Um, think of SpaceX, it's literally rocket science. These are knowledge barriers to entry. If you don't know how to do these things, you just can't compete. You can't sit at the table and play, play the game with the other guys. Um, then, you, and the, then you get something called scale barriers to entry. These are the weakest of all barriers to entry, um, but they do exist. And what scale barrier to entry says is it says that either you need to be really, really big for your business model to work, or when you get to being really, really big, because of returns to scale, pushing down your unit costs, you can compete so dominantly and so effectively against smaller competitors that you can price them out of the market. Either, either one, and sometimes a little bit of both, or, or, or scale barriers to entry. Now, BHP Billiton is a mining company, so sure, it's got mineral rights that are legal barriers to entry, but a lot of people mine, and there are a lot of mineral rights out there. What makes a major, a global major mining house a global major mining house? Well, it's got the biggest mines, and they're all over the world. So what you have is you have returns to scale at a mine level, and even at a at a company level, you diversify probably across commodities and across geographies. And all these things create an incredibly powerful entity with huge, huge scale, huge reach, deep pockets, and very, very low costs for what it produces that makes it able to compete versus, versus smaller miners and more regionally, uh, regionally concentrated smaller miners. People... People would think, uh, and the average person would probably think of Facebook as a knowledge or RP barrier to entry. I have a different perspective. Um, it's actually quite easy to make websites. Um, the RP is, the, the barrier to entry to competing in social media is often not the coding. 
The coding of Facebook is not technically complicated. The coding of Twitter is not technically complicated. What is complicated is getting critical mass. It's getting a billion people using your site. And in, in technological jargon in Silicon Valley, they call the scale barriers to entry of social media, they call it the network effect, where more people attract more people and they keep more people on the platform because no one wants to wander off on their own into, into the wilderness. They want to be part of the party. So you get returns to scale in terms of being having, having everyone on your site. Um, so Facebook is not actually a knowledge-based business. It's a scale-based business. Same with Tencent which is uh, protected by legal barriers to entry in China that uh, stop Western tech in many instances competing with it. But in fact, in China, it's got a scale barrier to entry. It's just big. Everyone is on it. Um, ShopRite, likewise, in terms of retail, you know, most you, you've got corner shops that can sell anything. How do they compete with ShopRite? Well, or how does ShopRite compete with them? Well, ShopRite's big, so it gets purchasing power and it can, it can really dominate with and squeeze out lowest prices, which leads to competitive advantages, which is the next, um, the next slide. Um, before I move on, barriers to entry come out in, in a range of different financial metrics. And like I said, simplistically, the higher the barriers to entry, the less the competitors, the more the profits. The more the profits, the higher the return on equity, high return on capital, high return on assets. If you're a scale-based business, you'll have high operating margins relative to smaller businesses in your sector. If you're an RP-based business, or even some, sometimes a legal uh, barriers, a, a legally defended business or industry, you'll have intangibles on and off the balance sheet. These are nice things to look at. Like I said, we're not going to focus on, on, on the technical. We're hitting big, broad concepts here. So I'm going to move on. But those are things you can look at and think at and research uh, uh, in your own time to find, uh, find and, and to compare them at, at, at a business level. Um, so we looked at uh, barriers to entry. And remember my, my terrible metaphor of a bunch of guys sitting around. Um, sorry, that's very sexy. I'm not sure why it's a bunch of guys. A bunch of people sitting around the table and playing poker. Um, and if you can get a seat at the table, then, then you've crossed the, uh, the barrier to entry and you're part of the industry. Competitive advantages is not concerned with that. Competitive advantages looks at the guys, the, the people sitting at the table playing poker and how do they compete with each other? So within an existing industry, how do existing competitors compete against each other? And there's really only three ways to compete. You can compete based on price. You have the lowest cost and therefore can offer the lowest price. You can compete based on differentiation. You, whatever you do is different for some other reason to your other competitors. Or you can compete based on focus. So you're not targeting the whole industry. You're targeting a subset of it that's very specialized and niche. Now, why is this important? Well, stronger competitive advantages means that you're better at beating the other players at the table. You can win more hands and you can either um, grow faster. So if you're a startup with strong competitive advantages, what those competitive advantages look like in a startup is a fast growth rate. Um, or if you're a late stage business, uh, but still have those competitive advantages, what they look like is um, a higher market share and a defended sustainable market share. Um, and ultimately all those translate into more or faster growing revenues, which translates simply into more or faster growing profits. So what I've done here in terms of examples is I've taken a snapshot at some of our domestic retailers, because all of these, all of these retailers have passed the barriers to entry. So they're already grabbed at a seat and they're sitting at the table playing poker. But how do they compete with each other? And for example, if you're competing on price, ShopRite and MassMart are a very good example. That the way they get you through their door is by um, having the lowest price, price point for whatever they're selling. 
if you're competing based on differentiation, though, um, Willie's is a good example. So you can buy a chicken sandwich from ShopRite or a chicken sandwich from Woolworths, and the Woolworths one will be much more expensive, but it also will probably be, depending on who you talk to, but I think the consensus would be, it would be better quality. It will taste nicer. Um, the differentiation Willie's goes for is quality. So they target higher LSM, particularly in the food space, and they build that into their price. That's the differentiation. The differentiation of Checkers 6060, which is a, a sub-business unit of ShopRite or an alternate part of the omni-channel omni, uh, route to market, um, is Checker 6060 is selling you convenience. That's what it's selling you. That is a differentiating factor. If you're looking at focus, what focus says is you're, you're targeting a different subset that you're not competing with everyone on this. So I could buy a chicken sandwich at ShopRite, I could buy a chicken sandwich at Willie's, but I won't buy a chicken sandwich at Sportsman's Warehouse. There, I'll buy my sporting goods and my athleisure and the like. They're targeting that subset of the market. Likewise, with Builders Warehouse, where they're targeting DIY and uh, building materials and the like. These are competitive advantages. Um, and, and the way you could track them is you can look at growth and revenue versus peers. Like I said, if you're a early or even mid-stage business with a really strong competitive advantage in the sector, your growth rate is probably beating peers because you're beating them on something. So look at growth and revenue versus peers or versus market. If you're a late stage, but defending, uh, and you've got a sustainable competitive advantage, and you, sus um, you probably have a very large market share. So you can look at size and revenue versus peers. Another way of looking, phasing that is market share. If you're competing based on differentiation or focus, perhaps even on price, depending on who you are, it should come out in gross profit margin. Um, you should have a bit of pricing power there or or, or sometimes if you've got price and scale, which tend to go hand in hand, um, it might come out in operating profit margin because you because although you're not pricing a lot for the good up front, um, you're a very large and efficient operating uh, entity. And therefore it comes out in volume and volume, the profitability of return to scale is best demonstrated by operating profit margin. Like I said, not focusing on those, moving on. Um, and I think it's important to pause here before we jump into the next concept, just to differentiate between barriers to entry and competitive advantage. Um, like, like I said, with that, with that uh, terrible metaphor of a, a group of people playing poker at a table, barriers to entry are how hard is it to get a chair and join the game? Um, that's external. It's, it, and hard barriers to entry make an industry attractive. Competitive advantages are once you've got a seat at the table, how effectively can you compete against the other players in the industry? Um, and strong competitive advantages make businesses attractive, even in potentially unattractive industries. This is an important point. Barriers to entry can make industries attractive. Competitive advantages make businesses attractive. Then shifting out, we're looking at it, we were looking at a very sectoral uh, view there of assuming an industry is only competing with existing players. And just to recap, higher barriers to entry, less competition, stronger competitive, competitive advantage, greater or faster growing market share, and the less competition, higher profits. But there are things called substitutes. Substitute goods or services cross sectoral lines with competition. Let me give you a terrible example. Um, you can either walk, cycle, drive, fly, Uber, catch a taxi. There are multiple ways to move yourself from one location to another location. Transport has many substitutes. Um, and in fact, in recent days and ages, and especially with the pandemic, technology is offering another substitute. You can actually call someone or you can have a Zooms meeting or a Teams meeting. You don't need to actually drive there. These are substitute goods and services. So if you're looking at the taxi industry, 
And you look at all the players in the taxi industry and you, you're actually missing the fact that the industry itself is competing with other industries and has substitutes, uh, products and services and the like. Consider, and, and I've touched on this, consider disruption. Technology is increasingly over time offering substitutes for traditional businesses. So it's creating, it's creating this disruption across industries. I mean, big techs, high growth rates have ultimately come from cannibalizing other industries through disruption. Google and Facebook's advertising revenue has come at the sacrifice of traditional media houses and television stations and radio stations advertising revenues. Um, Microsoft's operating system has come at directly probably out of um, a large number of other, you know, think of a, a traditional accountants and ways you'd, you'd run offices. So there's, it would cannibalize the stationary industry, for example, and things like that. So, in considering barriers to entry and the competitive advantages, you cannot look at it in the isolation of substitute goods and services. So how do we look at that? And how do we measure this? Other than conceptually and thinking about um, share of spend and alternatives, you can consider the growth rates and revenues in an industry relative to GDP. And what I mean by that is if an industry is growing slower than GDP, it probably is because the industry is being cannibalized somewhere else. So think of sunset industries that are being disrupted by tech. Um, growth in revenues versus peers. Um, and I kind of touched on that is I can get a chicken sandwich from multiple places. Um, those are all substitute goods. But in fact, if the price of chicken sandwiches goes up too much, well, uh, I don't have to get a chicken sandwich. I can get a you know, get a turkey sandwich or, or actually an egg sandwich, whatever. So consider within there um, sub substitution across products and services. Uh, and once again, and I hit on these ratios because the less, sorry, the, uh, the less substitutes you have, the stronger barriers to uh, entry and the better competitive advantages, the more pricing power you have, which will come through once again and gross profit margin and as you get an operating profit margin um, now all of these concepts really come to a head in the concept of pricing power what is pricing power all of you have encountered pricing power um, all of you have used a good or a service somewhere that the business has hawked it aggressively and you have complained but you've kept using it and you've paid that price. That is pricing power. It is how much and how aggressively can a business charge for its products and services? Um, in the truest sense of the word, this is where monopolies come to their fore, is they price gouge, especially, and a monopoly is probably somehow in a protected industry with basically infinite barriers to entry, it's there's the only one because it's monopoly so there's no competition and you absolutely have to use it's good so it can price whatever it wants and you just have to keep using it there are no substitutes for it that is perfect pricing power but pricing power has a concept called elasticity in economics and elasticity you can actually measure it is how much does volume change for a pro for a good or service when a business changes a pr its price. Um, and I'll use in this concept, the metaphor of uh, bread versus Ferraris. Um, if they were to double the price of bread tomorrow, well, assuming there's nothing else to eat because food has a lot of substitutes and we can eat other things. So perhaps, uh, perhaps actually in this example, I won't use the example of bread, I'll use the example of, of food. If all the food tomorrow doubled in price. As human beings, we still need to eat it. So we will pay that price and we will sac sacrifice other things. That's what we call non-discretionary spend, which is code uh, and marketing code for inelastic or defensive. Um, as opposed to Ferraris, 
if Ferrari dropped the price of Ferraris dramatically to one tenth of what its price was today, well, there would be a lot more Ferraris on the road. We'd all love to have a Ferrari. The only thing inhibiting us having a Ferrari is probably its price. Therefore, you change Ferrari's price, you get a large change in its, uh, in its volume, and we call that good elastic. Now, those are perhaps not fantastic examples, but it helps you think about pricing power. And um, consider what drives pricing power. And I'm going to run through what we've just spoken about. The higher a good's utility, the more scarce the supply of a good in an industry with a higher barrier to entry, less uh, in a business with stronger competitive advantages and no substitutes, the stronger the pricing power. Likewise, the opposite is true. Um, and perhaps food is actually a good example. Although food has huge amounts of utility because we need it there are lots of substitute uh, foods. So if the price of steaks goes exponentially up tomorrow, I would cry and I would not eat steaks. But you know what? I can eat chicken and other proteins. And in fact, I did perhaps, uh, perhaps I even fully swing it into vegan foods or this or that. So long as you're consuming calories and you're getting sufficient nutrition, you will live. Uh, and hence food as a deep product with deep utility is in an industry with very low barriers to entry that's highly competitive and importantly has lots of substitute goods. So how pricing power, how do we find it? Well, the logical way is gross profit margin and importantly track it over time. What you want to see is a very high gross profit margin and a sustained one and even better one that's actually rising over time. Very few businesses out there have have extremely strong pricing power. Most do to some degree and some, some absolutely don't. I mean, the extreme version of no pricing power is a commodity company. It's, it doesn't get to price its, its commodity. The market decides it for it. Doesn't mean that can be a bad business. There are other things that can make it good, but a, a, a really great business in the perfect world has pricing power. So strong profit margin. Have a look at real world things. Have a look at the change in volume, like for like volume growth versus like for like revenue growth. Don't forget revenue is volume multiplied by price. So which one is growing faster than the other one? Pricing power business revenue will be growing faster than volume because uh, they're passing those price increases onto, onto the end consumers. And once again, and I always keep on touching on these metrics because it all comes out in the watch and a really strong business has good returns in equity, good returns in capital, good returns on assets. The final thing to consider is something called the addressable market or total addressable market size. A business cannot grow larger than its market. If there is only one business in a market, the business's growth is the same as the market's growth because they are the same things. A market is an esoteric concept, just a collection of businesses. Therefore, a business cannot grow faster than its market forever. As it gains, it can at the beginning, as it gains market share, but ultimately its growth will uh, synchronize with the market's growth. And in fact, that that industry's growth will synchronize with the country's growth. And the country's growth will synchronize with the world's growth. Nothing grows forever. Trees do not grow to the, to the sky. Why, is a, why do we consider a market size important? Well, as investors, when I found a really good company in a, great, uh, in a greatly defended business um, industry with fantastic competitive advantages, no substitute goods, great pricing power, uh, ticks all the boxes. I want to make sure that, and it's growing fast. I want to make sure that it can grow into the largest possible business because that will carry my investment with it. Um, bigger is better than smaller in terms of addressable markets. Um, because you will, as you grow, you will create exponential wealth for shareholders along the way. And subtly in the background, you can generate returns to scale. As you get bigger and bigger, um, you, uh, your, your fixed costs get smaller and smaller of your base. 
uh, your funding costs drop in the background. You perhaps get pricing power in terms of your variable costs and ultimately it comes out in the wash as an incredible returns to scale. So you actually get better as a business. Um, as opposed to small addressable markets where you can make a fantastic little business, um, but it, 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 at some point it's maxed out in terms of how large it can get. Um, so in terms of large uh, addressable markets, consider things like food, water, housing, education, healthcare, communications. Now, if, if you know the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what I've just done is I've basically hit on all of the bottom ones. There is no one on planet Earth who doesn't need all of these things. Um, and therefore your addressable market is huge. Um, but like I said, in food, perhaps your barriers to entry and your substitute goods are what kills your returns. Something like healthcare and communications uh, have the legal barriers to entry, but there are other trade-offs, which I'll get, get into. Um, so look for those large addressable markets. Small addressable markets can still be attractive, but you, when the tree maxes out its growth, it's going to still remain very, very close to the ground. It's going to be a very small tree. Examples of small addressable markets are sugar mill ERP systems and traction monitoring systems for trains. All of these are needed. These are greatly profitable niches. And in fact, each, each of these is listed on the JSC right now, not for long. Um, I think both of them are effectively going to be delisted soon, uh, or are likely to be, but both of them are listed, both of them are profitable, both of them are great little businesses, but both of them are in very small addressable markets, so needed to be bought by the businesses and absorbed into the whole in order to get big. So this is the big picture of what you're looking for. Uh, notice I haven't spoken specifically about how businesses run. I've looked at big picture and big picture is what you're looking for in the perfect world is high barriers to entry with few competitors. With a business that has strong competitive advantages and no substitutes for its goods or service or goods and services. And therefore with little competition strong competitive advantages and no substitutes, it has incredibly resilient pricing power and it operates in the vacuum of a very large total addressable market. Uh, that is what you're looking for. The inverse is what you're not looking for. Now, those macro aspects and those big picture and business model characteristics I've unpacked don't, don't necessarily say whether the business is well run or not. You can have the best industry with the best business model that is operating in the largest total, total addressable market, but it is badly run and it won't work. So we've got to go a little bit more granular, granular here and ask the question of at a once we've identified the business in the industry, is that a good business? One step further, not just is it, is it a good framework the business is operating within and a good platform with a good business model, et cetera, et cetera, is it well run? And the absolute most important guarding principle is that cash is king. Yeah. A well-run business um, generates huge amounts of cash consistently, and they are growing. When in doubt, if there is more cash coming into a business than going out, that business is still in business. There is a concept called free cash flow. And free cash flow looks at the operating cash flows of a business. And the operating cash flows of a business are after you've paid your creditors, um, collected from your debtors uh, upon selling your good. And you've got your operating cash flows. That's effectively your operating cash flows. And there's some tax and the like that goes out of that. Um, and you paid, paid the government their, their pound of flesh, which is tax. How much of, 
uh, and we go one step further to make it a free cash flow. So those operating cash flows are not good enough. Remember, a business doesn't exist in isolation. You've got to invest, either reinvest in the maintenance of the business to keep it running. And in the best possible world, you actually want to invest in assets that are going to help it grow. Um, that's called capital expenditure broadly. And out of the operating cash flows, we take the capital expenditure. And what is left is literally free cash. It's cash that the business does not critically need. And that is, that is wonderful. The more free cash the business can generate, the better. Because that free cash flow will find its way some or other way to shareholders. Now, it can be applied to dividends. So literally, it can be paid to uh, shareholders. It can be applied to buybacks. Indirectly, that'll go to share, uh, shareholders. It can be plowed into research and development and marketing or sales to grow the business or the intellectual property. It can be applied to acquisitions to grow the business or go into different geographies, different, uh, different industries, parallel backward or forward integration. It can, the point is that free cash flow is so important. The best way to think about free cash flow is after you, most people are employed and they get a salary. After you've paid your tax on your salary, you get your net salary. There's retirement savings that hopefully go off. If there isn't, then you need to visit Just One Lap and watch a lot of Simon's uh, presentations because you're doing something wrong. So there should be savings that go off that. Then you have living expenditure. There's day-to-day, -day, there's food, there's a mortgage and et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to pay, pay your car and your fuel and everything. After all of that is taken off, is there still cash? More, uh, more cash in your bank account at the end of the month than the beginning. From a personal perspective, that is free cash flow. You could take that cash and put it into investments and do incredible things with it. Businesses are exactly the same. We're looking for free cash flow. Um, where do you see this? Well, the, the obvious starting point is there is a literal statement in the financials called the cash flow statement. Look at that. Look for operating cash flows, take out the capital expenditure, derive the free cash flows. Consider, the, consider how much of the income statement that is built based on IFRS or accounting principles uh, translates into the cash flow statement. Um, we call that the cash conversion ratio. And then consider, because you cannot pay your day to day expenditure with uh, accounting profits. You have to pay it with cash flows. Consider how this translates to current and quick ratios is something we call liquidity on the balance sheet. So once you've looked at cash flows and they are good, we then shift to a concept called, uh, called fixed versus variable costs. This is really how is the business's cost structure set up? Now, Neither is good nor bad, but it is important to consider them within the context of the business, the context of the industry, the context of a number of other factors like growth or absence of growth and, and the like in order to properly assess risk. What is the fixed cost? Well, fixed costs are independent of sales. A good example of a fixed cost is a factory. Once I've built a factory, I've spent all the money and I've sunk the foundation, I've put up the factory, I've bought the machines, everything. I've spent the money. If I never make a, a, a cent of sales out of that factory, I've still spent the money on the factory. That's a fixed cost. It is independent of the sales, which you go, wow, that's, that's terrible. But any sales I make thereafter is I don't need to spend that again until obviously you've reached 100% capacity at, uh, of 100% uh, uh, capacity in the factory. And hence we arrive at something called semi, semi fixed or semi variable costs. Because in order to double that, then I've got to build another factory. So you have a step change in, in cost. That's, that's outside of the ambience of this. If you understand the difference between fixed and variable, you will get the concept of risk within the cost structure. So fixed costs allow me to generate returns to scale. Because as I'm ramping up the output from that factory that I've, I've built, at some point, uh, any future sales I make there, 
once I've paid for uh, the costs of those sales, which are the variable costs, I'll get to that, all the profits are mine. And it exponentially ramps up, um, which leads me to those variable costs. As I'm ramping that factory up, um, I've got to be buying raw materials for whatever I'm producing there. That is variable costs. So variable costs change according to sales. Um, if I never make another sale from this factory, my variable costs will be zero in the, in the perfect world. Um, if I'm running at 100% capacity on this factory, my variable costs will be maxed out 100%. And, uh, and hopefully, so typically speaking, variable costs go into cost of sales and fixed costs go into operating expenses. It's not perfect. There is there are other technicalities for normal utilization and, and the like that can push fixed costs into, into cost of sales, but that's generally how they split up. And it's, conceptually, it's a simple, perhaps overly simplified way of thinking about it, but which is good or bad? Well, variable, source, uh, variable costs are safe. The reason they're safe is because um, if sales go backwards, I'm not paying them anymore. So my variable costs is like a variable lever. They will grow or shrink depending on the fluctuation of the business and the market and the economy. So variable costs are actually defensive, but variable costs don't scale very well. And if I'm really a good business and I'm really got a large addressable market, I want to actually operate on fixed costs because I will get returns to scale there. Um, the risk I'm taking in that instance is if I'm wrong and sales go backwards or sales don't materialize and I've spent all that money. So which is good or bad? You know, it depends, but it's important to consider the structure and the makeup of costs. And sometimes the businesses' competitive advantages from a, from a, a pricing perspective can be based exactly around this, these cost structures. So where do we find them? We find them in ratios like operating leverage, consider the head office costs and segmental disclosure. Um, you know, for example, do they have a huge shiny new and very awkward head office in Santon? No names mentioned. Look at uh, operating expenses, uh, perhaps even dig into results presentations to see if they break it down. Um, impact on the market has a very nice split in their results presentations between the fixed versus variable costs. It's not in their results, it's in their results presentation. And go and dig that up and you'll see. Have a look at the operating profit margin history. Fixed costs gen in the, with, with, with the same amount of volatility of sales, fixed higher proportions of fixed costs tend to create more volatile operating profit margins. Likewise, higher proportions of variable costs tend to, tend to generate more stable operating margins, albeit possibly smaller ones. Much like cost structure of the business, you've got to consider debt, gearing, and risk. These come hand in hand. If I go back to the cash, if there's more cash coming to a business than going out of the business, the business is still in business. Likewise, if you've got no debt and you've got cash coming in, more cash coming in, they're going out, well, your odds of bankruptcy are, are basically zero. Nothing's ever zero, but they're pretty, they're about as low as they can get. Likewise, if you've got huge amounts of debt, well, if something goes wrong, you can very definitely go under. Debt, as a rule of thumb, higher debt is higher risk. But lower debt is lower risk in the business, and debt is always relative. Why do I say debt is always relative? Well, if I were to say to you, here's a billion rand of debt, or I have a billion rand of debt, you would probably go, wow, that's a lot of debt, Keith. You need to uh, relook at your life decisions and uh, you know, that, sort some things out. And I would agree with you because a billion rand of debt well, is huge for the average individual. But is a billion rand of debt a lot for like Amazon or Google or Tesla uh, or some of the largest companies in the world? No, it isn't. So debt is relative. Um, 
And that's why, that's why we consider debt relative to a lot of things uh, in considering whether debt is high or low. Um, and what are those things we consider? Well, without going into the ratios, which I will touch, and going in the theme of the conceptual, the business and economic concepts we've unpacked fundamentally here, is the more defensive an industry, the more debt it can probably take. Um, the higher the pricing power of a business, the more debt it can probably take, because it can always pass on financial stress to its customers and they just have to swallow it. Um, the stronger the cash flows of a business, the more debt it can take. The more assets a business has, the more debt it can take. Um, but the more cyclical, the, the more elastic, or the more substitute, the more competition, the more fixed costs a business has, probably the less debt a business should have because you're already compounding risk upon risk then. Um, with all this concept about risk, why would a business want debt? Um, well, if I could borrow as a business at, for example, 5% interest, and I can put this into, into an asset that I know because I, it's my business and I could generate a 30% return. Well, I just need to pay the 5% interest and, and the capital back. Um, and then I've got a free 25% return that goes entirely to shareholders and wouldn't have existed in the absence of debt. So, whereas I say higher debt tends to be higher risk and lower debt tends to be lower risk, different businesses do have the right amount of debt. And then considering the right amount of debt, consider these attributes relative to the business and concepts of relative to the business. We would look at the liability section of the balance sheet, work through even the notes for contingent liabilities. That can hide a lot of things in there. Consider financial leverage, net debt to equity, net debt to assets, uh, interest cover, EBITDA, so various cover ratios and the like. These are comparing the debt relative to the business. Um, so conceptually, at a granular business level, what do we want to see? Well, we want to see a business that is consistent and strongly cash generative. Remember the concept of free cash flow. So important. I want to see strong, large amounts of that, large relative to profits because it's converting well, and I want to see it growing. Um, I also want to consider the appropriate cost structure. I'm not saying which one is good or bad. Consider the risk and the appropriateness of that cost structure. And I want to consider the appropriateness of the, of the debt on the balance sheet. And when in doubt, comparing two companies, if they're exactly the same, of all other things, you like both of them, probably pick the one with the least debt because it has less risk. Um, but consider the appropriateness of these things. Um, so now, Nothing exists in a vacuum, and there are a large number of external and internal variables as well that, that perhaps are wrapped into all these things, but also can arguably stand on their own. I call them, I just bundling them into other things to consider when thinking about industry, sector, competitive advantages, all these, all these things down to actual individual business level and the risk in, and the risk and opportunity embedded within these businesses. Because another way of phrasing risk is opportunity. Because um, all these risks properly dealt with actually create opportunities. So consider external variables, sovereign risk. What country is the business operating in or countries and what risk is that to it if you're operating in a country that suddenly blew out into a civil war or had a coup that's a problem current and most topical a sovereign risk in, in the world right now is china who is changing and shifting goal coast uh, uh, goal posts then we have regulatory risks wow so re regulation creates barriers to entry in industries like healthcare, like hospitals um but the regulator can change the rules. And there is a risk that if they change the rules, they, sh they harm the economics or they might actually just make your whole business model null and void. 
exchange, uh, consider exchange rate risks. If you operate in different currencies, how does that affect things? Um, different currencies having different embedded risks. Consider commodity risks. If you, you have no pricing power, so you're selling a commodity at whatever the spot rate is, there is a risk as spot rate goes down. And you could be the best run gold mine in the world. If, if gold goes to uh, $1 uh, an ounce, you're not going to be not going to be a great investment. Consider disruption. Um, this is the substitute risk I've touched on. Renewables and you know uh, EVs, electronic vehicles, disrupting existing uh, industries. Consider the end customer risk, supply chain risk, pandemic risks. Um, yeah. So end customer risk is obvious. You've and uh, uh, you've got an exposure to to terrible a terrible customer or terrible customers. Um, consider uh, and these are new risks, supply chain risks. So chips and extreme weather are very topical ones right now. Um, you can't if if you've got a key input or inputs into your business and you can't get it. Doesn't matter how great you are. You can't make a product. And therefore, you can't sell a product, and therefore, you are you're kind of dead in the water. Supply chain risks are, are key. Um, extreme weather, extreme weather ties into sovereign risks, but it has a more geographic specific spin because uh, countries don't have weather, geographies have weather, and if it is particularly extreme, it could wipe out business models, flooding or fires or droughts and etc. Pandemic risks are obvious. If your business and this is something we wouldn't have thought of two, three, four years ago. Um, if your business needs physical contact to operate, there is an embedded pandemic risk here. Um, consider internal variables as well. Revenue concentration risk, which goes hand to hand with end customer risk. Uh, if you've got one big customer and it's a bad customer, you might have a problem. Uh, you may not, but it is a risk. The whole point about risks is, is to consider them. Uh, technological obsolescence that goes hand in hand with disruption. Key man or key individual risk. Let's, let's go um, non-gender specific. Key individual risk. Uh, what if there is a key individual running a business and they either exit or they are no longer available in the most extreme event uh, a case they, they're dead? Um, is that business still viable? Governance risks. Uh, uh, go hand in hand with alignment, interest and conflicts of uh, interest. If you have the best run business in the best industry doing the best things, but everyone steals a blind, um, that's not going to work so great as a shareholder. Consider these things. And then obviously there's the broad basket of ESG related risks. So in summary, what you want to think about when researching a a uh, business and, and looking and poking around, looking for these fundamentally fantastic businesses to invest in, is you want to find industries with high barriers to entry, with few competitors sitting at the table, strong competitive advantages at a business level, and no substitute goods or services for what they offer that leads that business to have fantastic pricing power and hopefully within a large total addressable market. All of this with a management team that is running the business, consistently generating strong cash flows, free cash flows, with an appropriate cost structure, an appropriate debt, when in doubt, go for no debt is better than some, or, uh, but appropriate debt. And just in the background, consider the other major risks. Don't get blindsided by risks. If you take a risk, make it a cognizant one. Next time, once you've found these businesses, how much do you pay for them? And that's what we're going to discuss next time. We're going we're gonna to unpack the valuations of these businesses in the market. So fancy disclaimer. And that's open for questions, guys. Uh, Keith, that was epic. Uh, and your timing was spot on. So there were some questions, but Michelle popped in and she gave answers to those already. And Tondo agree, can't wait for part two. A uh, question from Tabang um, asking about uh, how is it possible a company can enter a high barriers to entry sector that also still has high total addressable market? Uh, what sprung to mind for me 
was licenses. For example, the JSC, high barrier to entry, big market, and suddenly we've got four exchanges. Um, the, they issue from time to time new casino licenses or hospital licenses, banking licenses. So certainly in, in the legislative place, uh, often they just issue more because it's, it's tax for, 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 uh, for government. Keith, your thoughts? Uh, that's that's a good example. Um, I'm going to give you an even bigger and more obvious one. Yeah, yeah. COVID COVID nineteen vaccines. Uh, Your total addressable market yo. is planet Earth. Um, all you needed to do was invent it. Well, and have the kit. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, so there are different ways, and it's always special when that happens. So if you can see that happening, and you can position yourself for that, that could be a fantastic investment. Yeah. Now, I hear you in that. Um, a fellow asks, this is not a, a small business not making income. Would it be a vi advisable to get into debt to finance growth? Um, I think this is more of a specific question. Keith, to your point on your slide, uh, if you just back up two slides there where you were saying uh, debt is as little as possible, truthfully, um, and needs to be appropriate. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So outside of the context of that business and without a deep dive to be able to answer it, so we're answering very broadly and generically, equate debt with risk. And the more certain you are the business is going to succeed, well, mm -hmm. you could probably then take more debt, but be very careful with that because many a good business has been throttled or killed with too much debt as well. So yeah. when in doubt, um, err on the side of caution when it comes to debt. Yeah, that is not already... what the bankers will tell you because they're no, selling no, no. you debt. <laughs> um, someone, I forget, probably my grandfather told me that debt is always fine until it's not. And when it's not, it is just like always too much and really, really bad. I think Oscar Wilde said it, and I could be wrong, but uh, how, how does one go bankrupt? Well, at, yeah. slowly and then quickly. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But we will park it there. Tabang, absolute pleasure. Sonelli agreed. Uh, Gaston, yes, it was great. And Jabula, Donald, uh, everybody else, uh, appreciate your time all this evening. Yeah, Keith, that was totally epic. Everyone, we are back in... Uh, now, where's my calendar? It'll be the... Second Thursday in November, it will be the 11th of November. Same time, same place. If you're here this evening, your booking will automatically kick in for next time. Keith, that was absolutely epic. Appreciate the time. Uh, thanks a ton. Thanks, Simon, and thanks everyone who attended.